Welcome to Dreamland Farm. My name is John. This is my wife, Jen. Hi. This is the home of Island Organic Cuisine, Hawaii Tropical Fish Gardens, and Paradise Nectar Apiaries. Come on in. Come on in. Let's Check it out. show you around. Well, the bees need one million blossoms per hive to actually sustain themselves. So if you grow like 12 different things, then you don't really feed bees very well. But if you see like how they're on the African basil here, they need lots of little blossoms of the same kind in order to actually be able to get something worthwhile and feed themselves. So we do the Tulsi basil over there, this African basil. We have the portulaca, which is the little yellow one. Um, those are things that we can grow super easily. It's like the lazy farmer's dream. because You can just stick them in the ground. Yeah, nasturtiums and sunflowers. Think about things that are easy, like the, the nasturtiums over here on the side. They just grow up and the bees love them. And then you can eat any part of them, like the leaf and the flower and the stem. Bees are why we have healthy organic food. Like if we keep using these things in the environment, we're going to kill off the very creatures that give us the foods we want to eat. It's like taking ourselves out. It's, you know, we got to see and have foresight ahead to realize like it's so easy to grow this and not use chemicals and feed some bees. I mean, it's six inches of one of these things. If people just were like, oh, what do I do? You can go out, shove this in the ground and grow a whole bunch of sunflowers and the bees are gonna have food. And so I'm really just hoping to ha help people see a shift in the mindset of like, everybody can make a difference. Like one honeybee can, can keep her hive alive by going out and foraging for food. Like this tiny little creature. You know, if we think about how big and capable we are, kind of changes the perspective of what we're capable of. So you can see I named my hives. They're not livestock or a commodity to me. They're family, they're sisters, they're, you know, creatures that have been with me for years and years and they all have a story and they all have their own personalities and it's a definite like relationship and, and communion, more of a, a spiritual connection for me which is why I'm doing what I'm doing now and shifting away from feeling the pressure of having to have a set amount of honey for the stores or a set amount of these things because it feels then like I have to need something from them. And I don't want to need anything from them anymore. They've done so much and they've brought so many blessings into my life from this farm to even John started out as my apprentice, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. So the bees have brought me a lot of abundance and beauty. And I feel like now is my time to just be in a conservation mode with them to just share and connect and bond with them and help them grow and listen because they are very clear in what they're communicating with us. These are top bar hives and Langstroth hives. If you see the small rectangular box over there, this one in the center, these are Langstroth hives. They're the traditional stackable box. Um, they have frames in them. I do foundationless frames. Um, so I don't use like a, a foundation insert or pre-made wax piece. And so the, the Langstroth hives are not my favorite because they are so heavy to lift, right? So you'll see there's only, there's like two over there and two here and that's it because I don't want to lift more than my body weight in something. And if you look at videos of old school beekeepers, they often look like this. That's not how I want to go out. <laughs> so I'm trying to like keep my posture. So John builds me these awesome topper hives and the topper hives I can show you without opening it here. This is why I like it because I can stand comfortably. I can pull out each one and hold it up in a way that's comfortable to me. I'm not hurting myself. I can bring our tractor down with buckets and pull it right here. I have a little like one of those lawn tractors, a lawn mower and a wagon. And I can just pull it here, put the stuff in my buckets, cruise it up to my honey house. And there's no really heavy duty stress on my body. So to me, this is just a no brainer, like easier hive to work with because it allows me to also not expose the bees to so much air. When you open the hive, you change the temperature. So what they are trying to keep at 95 to 98 degrees, I open this, now all of a sudden I'm letting a draft in. I'm also letting their scent out, which can attract small hive beetles and other pests. So keeping it tight and neat is I ideal. And the topper hive is cool because you can move with only exposing two sides of the comb at any given time. So I'm not having to just, like with a, one of those, I pop the lid and now they're open. 
and I'm totally letting light and air in and everything is changing for them. And so they get more aggressive and they get more alert and then they have to work harder to keep the pests and things out. So to me, that hive is more laborious for the bees and for me, but because I'm a teacher, I both. This hive, the bees build everything. They do everything. And they do the same in there, but they have to work in a different way because bees, see how my necklace hangs in this shape? That's how bees want to build their comb, is like this. And so this hive actually allows them to build in their natural form. Whereas if you look at a Langstroth hive's comb, they, the bees kind of get creative. They don't really know how to fit in a box. They're not really, like, it's not their natural design. So just watching them and doing wild hive removals and things, I just naturally kind of went to this. And then I read The Barefoot Beekeeper in like 2008, and I loved Phil Chandler's design, but it didn't work for me because I needed to have something to trap beetles. So there's a screen down here that only beetles can fit through and mites, and they fall through the screen and they go into a drawer down here that I can just come and pull out. And it's got diatomaceous earth in it so that the beetles and the mites will fall in there. And then we take that and we put it in our gardens or we give it to our chickens and they eat and dust and they get rid of their mites. And so this is actually a full cycle system. We can make a compost, it takes care of pests, and I keep my bees safe. So I keep trying to find these sustainable systems because I believe that there's no such thing as waste. There's only stuff in the wrong place. So over here is uh, Hawaii Tropical Fish Gardens. It's a, I do retail of, and I breed a uh, bunch of different freshwater tropical fish. I got koi, goldfish, guppies, garamis, cichlids, a lot of different things here. Yep, and I'm open here on the weekend, on Saturday from 11 to 5, hawaiitropicalfishgardens.com. I'm on Instagram, uh, Facebook, all that good stuff. We grow a lot of green beans. Some bugs started eating them. I think it's the Japanese it rose beetle. But we still have some. I've, it's a good learning experience. I've learned that these Japanese rose beetles, they only come out at dusk. So only out for a few hours. And so if you can trick them because they like dim light, but they don't like bright light. So I got this bucket over here with one of those solar pathway lights in it. And I put some soapy water in here. And you can see there's a few of those bugs right there. So they come out to reproduce and they get attracted to this instead of the plants themselves uh, in hopes that they will not do that. <laughs> we tried to grow a lot of different things. Like this whole thing a week ago was a bunch of tomatoes. And then after all that rain that we got, the tomatoes were just looking sad and they were attracting bugs. And we were like, no, we're over that. So John went and did this huge clean out of a bunch of the tomato plants and some eggplant that was just kind of sad from the rain. And then you can see what fills in the gaps. Like the nasturtium is like, crazy. oh, I got room to grow and the kale is all happy. And so it's just, things yeah, fill in. Sure. Yeah, we actually had one harvest that so they produced like three of them, but then we had a big rain that made two of them kind of melt. So we're hoping for a better crop and we're yeah. trying out asparagus. Yep. We really want to do, I love asparagus. I think it'd be so cool if we had a bunch of it. We have a really good crop of Swiss chard right now though. It's been delicious and the kale's been amazing. Right now what I've been doing is I have a broad fork, uh, but initially I'll kind of clear the ground. I have this thing called this hoedad. It's like a big hoe. Um, I'm surprised I don't just have it laying around. But it's this big hoe, and so I can clear the sod off really easily. And then I go in with the broad fork and loosen it up. And sometimes if the grounds, I haven't worked the ground at all, I'll go actually with a shovel and do like a double dig. But it's, it's not, clay not soil. Yeah. yeah, It's just like dirtish app compacted ash uh, so i'm still trying to work with what i got unfortunately the previous owner sprayed around here so i've been remediating the soil and but this has been 
so many different shapes and, and ways like we yeah. keep changing it because we've learned that the nematodes they'll get really established in the soil so if you don't move your crops and change things up then you get kind of a stagnant more pest infested ground and so like we'll do a crop of corn over there but then the next crop of corn will be over here you know and really like rotate things around so that we're not attracting the same pest to the same area and I think it's really helped. Like now our new flow here with things going down seems to be really helping. That's not too much water standing. So we're learning, you know, like work with your landscape and see how it goes. But it's been interesting because this place was totally covered in that Wainaku grass. Like what, there's some of it like over here. It's everywhere. It's, it's obnoxious. Like you try to pull it out and you got these torpedo roots that go down. And so we actually sifted all the soil and started this garden bed over here. It took the time to do all this work trying to get this grass out of there. And then we realized like this was taking over months of our life. And like we just were devoting way too much time to this one grass. And so we decided to just kind of move forward and deal with it. So the whole idea is grow crops, harvest less stuff, and then basically like wipe the slate clean start over like with you know till it with the tractor get everything all turned over and then redo the rows and plant in it so we're not just it doesn't become so laborious it was becoming this thing that was just too much it was daunting yeah you can see the newest baby on the farm do you name her yet him him i'm gonna call him boots he's kind of have these like white boots on the back so his mama is Bodie, and you can see the baby over there, Boots, and Lilia behind them is actually pregnant. Um, well, we originally got them just to eat grass, yeah, because we'd rather not have to cut grass, and especially so all this grass. We have two cows down on the lower six acres. Um, that that's their job. That's all they do. They eat grass. They're like pets that eat grass. Well, they, they were um, milking cows yes, too. <clears throat> I was milking the cows for, for and making like six different kinds of cheeses and ice creams and cheesecake and you name it. I yeah. was really into it, you know, and like if you if all you can do is make these products for yourself, that's great. You have them for yourself. But like I was getting three to five gallons of milk every day. And especially when I was milking both cows, it's like six and a half, yeah. seven gallons of milk a day. Like there's only so much storage and so much cheese and so much paneer that people can eat, you know? I was <laughs> so, drinking like a half a gallon of milk by a day myself, yeah. trying to put it down. So we were kind of like living on dairy products when we were doing it and it became very labor intensive for me. So I just let them go to being pets for now. And I do want to, to milk them eventually. That will happen again. I feel like cows are, to me, milk and honey. That's how you have a sustainable farm. Mm -hmm. Those two things are kind of like mm -hmm. the fuel for everything in a way. The goats are my thing. I really love goats. I got them um, right after COVID started. Everything started shutting down. I was like, well, I'll get these baby goats since I have some time to take care of them. So I bottle raised these, uh, the two females here. This is a new addition. He's on loan to hopefully procreate with these ones so we can get little kids around here. And His name is Speckles. Yeah, the sheep can actually get to the other side of the ponds over there. <clears throat> And the goats, since they're a lot more destructive, you know, if they were to get out, it'd be a whole thing. And they're really picky anyways. So all this sunflower and a lot of these things, the guava, I go and chop a bunch of stuff down and bring them fodder. So that way they get a variety in their diet. Um, I used to take care of goats when I first moved here to the island. And my job when I was there was to actually go out in the jungle and cut down a variety of nitrogen fixing trees, legumes, and bring them into the goats and feed them. And then I'd get the milk in return and ability to stay in a place and really fell in love with goats then just because of the personality. And I really enjoy goat milk products. Goat cheese. Yeah, and milk that. itself. It's I'm excited for when we have goat mm -hmm. stuff. That's our chicken area. I like to do both egg chickens, like laying chickens and meat birds. Uh, I think good, healthy meat. Like I, I've been a vegetarian for the longest time, but the last about year I started, I processed some chickens, some tur uh, roosters that I had here. 
because I was like, well, I got to do something with them. I was getting all these fertilized eggs and they were hassling the other chickens and it was a situation. So I dealt with them and after that, it's just kind of been game on. Like, to be able to get a good source of protein, I mean, vegetables are great and everything, but it's, it's different. Like I get a different kind of energy from chicken and animal products that I do from vegetable and plant products. And so far, it's our number one seller in Island Organic Cuisine. Yeah. Like chicken quesadillas, chicken crepes, and chicken sandwiches are by far the number one things we're selling. This is our uh, commercial kitchen, Island Organic Cuisine, where we sell all organic food. A lot of it's grown here, like cassava, green beans. Yep, try to grow as much as we can here. This is the chicken blini. Blinis are made with organic cassava flour, eggs, milk, and butter, and loaded with chicken and spinach, sriracha, bell peppers, onions, deep fried burrito covered in sriracha with homemade salsa, sour cream on a bed of spinach. Chicken quesadilla on a flour tortilla loaded with lots of organic chicken, onions, bell peppers, sriracha on a bed of spinach and nachos loaded with sprouts, cheese, carrots, bell peppers, onions, black beans, and some homemade salsa and sour cream. Come check us out in Kaya Caja, 213 Claniani Street, Tuesdays, Thursdays through Saturdays from 10 to 6 p.m. Thanks for coming to see us. Enjoy your food. Bye.